Pauline. I'll, I'll, I'll stand here and not pace. Um, that was just so lovely to hear from Vivian. I, I, um, I wish she was here for, to, uh, I just immediately thought of a couple of threads from her work into mine, which I'll no doubt weave into this and maybe I can tweet her later. How lovely. Um, so, yes, so my presentation today um, is building on um, some theoretical work that um, you may have heard about <laughs> for um, open education and social justice. And I want to present today um, some uh, empirical results that are still in publication. So I have a book chapter accepted and is in review process and that'll be released towards the end of the year in a, in a book about inclusive um, education as a human right. And uh, so this is um, one slice of the PhD study and it's looking at some good news about some work that really is making a difference and I'm using the lens of social justice um, to, to explain why I think progress is really being made. If, if, you, if, you, if you tend to look at it through that lens of social justice, there is some, some reason to be happy. Um, and so um, to begin with, I want to also just recognise the help I've had from GOGN through the whole course of my um, study, which continues, but also specifically funding me to attend. Um, otherwise, I would be remotely speaking to you from Australia. Um, also, I want to acknowledge how um, supportive the Twitter community has been contributing ideas and feedback on the work as it's developed and, and I welcome that. I'm Sarah Lambert Oz. I really would love to have lots more people following because that means I, I can get um, have more conversations and feedback. So I really welcome that and um, um, feel free to chat that way anytime. So um, when, when we're doing work on social justice, I just want to position myself so you know where I'm coming from. Um, I, I, I am a learning designer, or I have been a learning designer working in a regional uni all my career, or two regional, large regional unis in Australia. Um, and and that, that positioning as being regional other than city, um, dealing with low socioeconomic communities is just a business as usual reality is something that, um, and as a strength, you know, as a place of innovation and leadership and strength is something that informs my work absolutely. But also I'm the first in my family to at attend university and that is a big thing for me personally. And in Australia there's lots of people of, of a similar age who were given an opportunity to have free higher education which is no longer there. And in the universities where I work there are typically, you know, in a in many teaching and learning forums, over 50% of the people there will say, I'm first in family. So this sense of social justice in giving back is strong and, um, and it's big for me. My mother, I will be dedicating my thesis to my mother who did not have the opportunity to attend university and suffered, really, uh, on all of the levels that you can, financially, emotionally, socially, excluding sexual harassment, abuse, underpayment, the whole lot, you know, and as a single mum I lived through that and she said to me, get a degree Sarah, you'll be taken seriously and it's something that meant a lot. And being taken seriously has been a long arc for me in my career and in short I've, I, have, I have my own struggle, juggle, debt, <laughs> gender, um, regionality, all of that's tied together. So I have that lived experience of both being included and excluded and the you feel the difference keenly. So this is a big topic. I don't claim to have any other lived experience of these social justice issues. I want to be clear, Re gender and regionality is something that's lived and other things I just feel connected to and that's what's driving, I think, where I needed to do this research. But I'm still learning. Be kind. I'm still learning. I was so uh, thrilled to hear Su Ming's alternative lens. I'm learning so much from collaborators. So. Um, uh, it's, uh, I'm here to listen and, and reflect. So I started this research problem as an open education practitioner who had invested a lot of time in approaching um, that op open education courses as social justice to give back to underserved learners. Became a, a kind of difficult reality in about 2014 when the data started to come back that all of that MOOC investment that a lot of us had a lot of high hope wasn't actually hitting the target. So I think uh, Diana Lorillard um, sums it up here and I will just read it. 
So the demographics of massive open online course analytics show that the great majority of learners are highly qualified professionals and not, as originally envisaged, the global community of disadvantaged learners who have no access to good higher education. And from a gender perspective, I was particularly um, frustrated with this sort of Emmanuel's research coming out and confirming that particularly within a lot of the topics that were happening in MOOCs, which is sort of IT uh, and business and, and kind of technical topics, predominantly young males seeking to advance their career. I'm like, that's great that people have an opportunity to develop but I thought we invested for a slightly different reason and we invested a lot. What happened to that aspiration? What, how did we have that rhetoric and the reality be so different? How did that happen? And more importantly then, how could we do that differently? So that's roughly been the trajectory of the research question. First, how did it happen? That was an interesting <laughs> journey and I have written about that. Um, and, and, but this section is about how can we do it differently, which is the, the, the nicer side, you know, the, the positive news story. So um, in the book chapter, I, um, I selected seven case studies of open online education as social justice, and five of them were taken from this major empirical systematic review done, um, which is a global search of the literature for cases meeting those social inclusion or student equity objectives 2014 to 17. So there were nearly 50 studies, many of them were staff and policy which were really interesting but I, I did a second qualitative analysis looking at the case studies where there was some evidence for enablement of particular cohorts of marginalised students. And the thing that was really fantastic looking at those is the richness and, and they did do the job. At some cases amazingly so and they, those programs were reaching over 200,000 disadvantaged learners. So it's not an insignificant number and it has potential for this kind of different model which often has blended support, face-to-face -face study groups, for example, online ones and face-to-face -face local community partnerships developed out of local needs for people, facilitated by local people was a sort of common thing. And so there is a potential to scale some of these up but it's doing MOOCs differently or it's doing that, that, um, that kind of thing. I also did two brand new cases. One of them was Siavula and, um, and one of them is an Australian study. So I've had to sift through all of that and, um, and the book chapter does seven. I'll probably only get a chance to do a couple today but I'm going to leave the details in the slide so you can follow all of the seven at, at the case. Um, I analysed the cases and that sense of success through the lens of um, a new definition uh, aligned to social justice. I'm actually going to read this because it's key to how I'm proceeding. So what I suggested in my, um, in my proposed definition is that open education is the development of free digitally enabled learning materials and experiences primarily by and for the benefit and empowerment of non-privileged learners who may be underrepresented in education systems or marginalised in their global context you'll see primarily by and for. It means there's space for other options, but it just puts a primacy focus of where the need is greater. And then I have a success measurement. I'm proposing that success can be measured not by any particular technical feature or format, but instead by the extent to which they enact redistributed, recognitive or representational justice, which are roughly speaking the economic, the free because it's too expensive side, the recognitive, the social, the multilingual, the multicultural, the gender identity side and the representational which is the kind of voice of the learner, the voice of the community speaking for themselves. For example, black voices telling black stories, not being told by, by white voices would be the classic example there or indigenous knowledge as leadership, you know, not being something done to. So those are the frames. Um, so you would have seen the textbook broke. This is an amazing campaign I watch with um, interest from Australia. Our students are not on the campaign trail yet, but they may be soon. So clearly, you know, free textbooks is an act of redistributive justice. You're redistributing resources from to people who by circumstance have less. It's a very simple concept, it's the most long-standing one. But also recognitive justice is so important and I'll read this quote and you'll see that for Ragda Ali, 
then it might be able to afford that education, but is Ragda Ali getting a job at the end in the same way that her peers? So after completing this qualification in Australia, I applied for many junior positions where no experience in sales was needed, even though I had worked for two years as a junior sales clerk. I didn't receive any calls. So I decided to legally change my name to Gabriella Hanna. And I applied for the same jobs and got a call 30 minutes later. And this is Ragda Ali from Sydney. And unfortunately, if you care to look, this research is long, wide and deep and in every single country. So this issue of you might have a job, but do you have decent work? that pertains to what you've studied and are you getting those jobs at the same rate that people who are called Gabriella Hanna are getting? And the answer is no. So as educators interested in justice for our students, it's not enough to make the thing free. We must think about what is the thing saying, you know, and who gets to say that. And I think open education resources and practices can embody all of those things and my study suggests that when we do it, you get some great outcomes. So I'm not going to drill into that. I think I've given enough examples. So let's just move through. Here's the seven cases. Um, what I did with this little summation, I actually looked at uh, 20 exemplars and then I evaluated them against the three forms of social justice and I did the, old, the tick box there. And then these were the seven that ticked the most boxes, literally. And so these are the ones that, that made it into the shortlist. So you will see that um, all of them are redistributive justice where there's a regionality to it. They're reaching regional students. The second one, they're benefiting women primarily and others. They are recognising the social, the multilingual, so multiple languages, and they are allowing a voice to come through that represents uh, marginalised learners. So, for example, in the, in the multilingual IC2 MOOC for European teachers, in that program, it wasn't just that it was free. In the recognitive justice column, you have the fact that they're actually participating in their local language with not one, not two, but seven different local language facilitated groups. And that was enormously powerful. And I think something that has a lot of potential. So the English is the language of instruction. The English is pretty good, but the confidence to speak in your own language, in your own voice, with your own people, to your own context, and that's when the representational justice comes in. Make it local for your school. Make a lesson plan that speaks to your community. Of course, that's going to work when you can communicate to your peers as you go along. So that's a powerful one. The South African Multilingual Maths and Science text, this is the Sea of Ulla case for people who know that leading organisation. And they produced an online platform to help a whole community co-author in multiple languages. And so this one allows, for example, through this diagram, you can see that they leveraged volunteer labour. They hired, um, hired labour as well to facilitate workshops on the ground to build a community and then the online platform allowed for them to develop their voice together. One of the neat things about this platform was that there was no role or rank. So they had very high ranking government officials and very modest regional school teachers in dirt floor schools um, making comments about how to best teach that and making a better quality thing in a couple of different languages teacher's guide in some of the 11 languages. So you can see the three levels. Yes, it's free. It recognises the difference and it gives the voice to difference. It's the three levels of justice working together. So these are some of the cases that I've been particularly inspired by and there are more that can show those three in action. But I think that it shows that free online technologies can give a little more to those who have less. But we're thinking about the resourcing, the respecting and the voice. And I think as designers of programs, we can think about social justice as a process in how we develop as well as in an outcome of what we produce. So my, my data is also showing that community com partnership with social communities, not just technical platforms, so not just partnering with edX to do a MOOC, but partnering with a community school or uh, employment agency 
broadening the notion of partnership can actually bring a strength to your program where you're speaking to and for a community and extending your reach to places you just can't go when you're sitting inside a university. So that would be my key message today about some of the things coming from these exciting cases where people are doing it differently and reaching students who people are saying it's hard to reach. But I say with community together, with collaboration and social justice principles and terms as tools, I think we can make a difference. Thank you. Well done. Lively, lively, Sarah. Great insights. Questions to Sarah? Questions, input, concerns? <laughs> well, <stop. laughs> well done. A round of applause to Sarah. Thank you. I might just spend that minute just um, giving a plug to our, our GIME Special Edition Open Education and Social Justice. So this is an opportunity to surface even more cases um, um, letting people tell their story in these different ways so we can all learn to think and do differently. So this is abstracts in June, papers at the end of the year. We will hope to publish this special edition in GIME for OER20.